go from there. Awesome. All right. Take it away, Nathan. Thank you. All right. So, um, first, before I get into the talk, I do want to say that there's no code in this. Um, this is more about just kind of the ideas, the concepts, kind of the evolution of chess engines. Um, do a little bit of history. We are going to talk a little bit about how to play chess. Um, but the the idea is, or, or the the what I want you to get out of this talk is more along the lines of um, how you can take some of these ideas and hopefully apply them to problems that you're trying to solve, um, as opposed to giving you concrete implementations that you then have to try to mess with and um, you know, no implementation is going to be the same, right? Even if you're writing your own chess engine, any code that I would show may not fit in with anything that you've already written. So um, I've tried to keep it relatively high level, but uh, because of that, um, you know, feel free to throw questions into the chat. Uh, Justin and I are going to try to keep an eye on it. Um, I'm not one of those speakers who uh, like runs by a script and, and, you know, wants all questions at the end or anything like that. Um, feel free to interrupt, uh, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom or anything to grab some attention. Uh, I think it's kind of easier to talk about those concepts uh, when we're on those slides or while we're talking about it already as opposed to at the end and going back. However, we'll do a Q&A at the end for those who come up with questions at the end. So let's dive in. So first, who watched The Queen's Gambit on Netflix? Yeah, yeah. you can't really raise your hands on Zoom. No big deal. I'm just going to assume literally everybody did, and that's why you're here. Um, if you haven't, it is a great series, even if you don't know how to play chess. Totally recommend it. Um, but that being said, uh, it would be great if you could raise your do a little raise hand things in Zoom. Does anybody here actually play chess? Like you, you study it, you you play it regularly in a club or anything like that. I don't see any hands going up, which is looks awesome. like Lars. We got we got oh, one one. All right, we got one person, two, <laughs> two people. That's amazing. Awesome, Sean. Uh, the, the other times I've given this talk, I was the only one raising my hand. So I, I don't feel super alone anymore. That's amazing. So uh, before we get started, um, again, a little bit of Zoom interactivity here for, for those that, that want to. Um, I'm just kind of want to get a lay of the land, try to figure out who's heard of what concepts. Uh, just so I, you know, as we get deeper into these slides, I kind of know what to focus on. Um, so first of all, for those who didn't raise your hands, have you heard of chess? I certainly hope so. Otherwise, why are you here? Um, I assume we've all heard of machine learning. Yeah. We've all heard of artificial intelligence. We can sit here and debate the difference between the two. Neural networks. I'm pretty sure everybody in this meetup has heard of that. And deep learning. Pretty sure everybody's heard of that. So let's get to the trickier ones. Minimax and Negamax. It's kind of CS 101 sort of stuff for some people. I've never heard Any? of Negamax. So Negamax? Okay. Well, we're going to get to it. You will know what it is by the end of this. Um, alpha beta pruning. Sean still got his... Uh, hand up and I don't know if that's just left over or not. Evaluation functions. Reinforcement learning. Here's a tricky one, bit boards. It's one thumbs up, but I'm gonna say that was for reinforcement learning. So I'm not actually gonna talk about bit boards. I just threw that in there for fun. Um, bit boards are the uh, like data structure that's used to represent a chessboard. Um, and using like, you know, XOR functions and stuff, you can switch around the pieces very efficiently. Um, so if you are looking at creating a chess engine of your own, bit boards are what you're gonna wanna look at for your data structure to represent the game itself. Um, but again, this is more about the concepts. I'm not really gonna get into like the implementation of bit boards here. So who am I? Uh, real quick, I'm Nathan Loading. I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, he, him. Um, I'm married, I have two kids, they're upstairs, annoyed that I'm not hanging out with them right now, but no worries. Um, I love history, so we're going to talk about a little bit of history in this talk, but what I love more than history are Oreos. 
Uh, Oreos are my favorite dessert. And if you put Oreos in ice cream, it's even better. Uh, and I currently work as a developer advocate at Kamunda, which is a business automation platform or process automation platform, sorry. Um, and if for some reason you have any questions about that at the end, I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter and all the other stuff on my full name there. Um, but I put the asterisk there because usually I'm tweeting about personal stuff as opposed to uh, like technical stuff. So like I said, I like history. I think that when we're talking about technology like this, I think it's interesting and helpful to look back on kind of the evolution of it. How did we get from Alan Turing in the 1950s and that form of computer to where we are today? Um, you know, arguably what he created uh, at Bletchley Park to solve the Enigma machine is, you know, a form of um, high level computing that we're doing today to crack passwords and solve board games. Um, so, so real quick, kind of going back in history, if anybody wants to throw a, a guess in the chat, when do you think the first chess engine was created? What year? Does anybody have a guess? 1950. <clears throat> no. 1769. It's called the Mechanical Turk. And I'm lying to you, it was actually a fraud. Um, so the Mechanical Turk was one of those brass metal automaton machines. Um, and it played chess and it stunned the world. Um, it, it, they toured like royal courts in, in Europe. Um, ben Franklin played it and lost. It was a big deal. Uh, but then uh, after the creator died, uh, somebody else took it over, carried it on for a few years. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that there was actually a person sitting inside the machine, <laughs> moving little levers to move the pieces around. Uh, so Lars, was actually right. It was 1950. It was technically the first chess engine. It was called TuroChamp. Uh, it was an algorithm written by Alan Turing. Um, it's considered the first video game from some history that I was reading. Um, however, it never actually ran on any hardware. Uh, the games that it was played with, uh, like Turing would actually sit there with a pencil and paper and, and figure out his equation uh, to figure out what the next best move should be. Um, and then unfortunately it's been lost to time. Nobody knows where it is or what happened to it. Excuse me, it's just kind of disappeared. Uh, next big milestone, 1957, Alex Bernstein at MIT created the first uh, uh, quote unquote true chess engine and actually ran on computer hardware. Uh, it could handle, what was it 40? Let me look at my notes, 42,000 instructions a second. It had 70K in memory. Uh, and it could do a four ply search in eight minutes. So when we talk about a ply, we're talking about one move um, or one player's move in chess. Uh, and then, you know, white plays first, then black plays, then white plays, then black plays. And so when white plays, that's one ply. When black plays, that's one ply and put together, that's move number one. So it could do uh, basically two moves, two, two uh, pairs of moves, black and white, black and white. Uh, and it would take eight minutes to search through that. After that, 1958, um, an engine created by Newell Sean Simon uh, beats a human for the first time. However, there should be an asterisk next to that because the person that it played learned chess one hour before they actually played the machine. So it's not necessarily the best example. Uh, in 1970, all the nerds started getting together and we had the first all computer uh, pure chess engine championship. I honestly don't remember which engine won in that match. Um, 1988, Brent Larson is the first uh, chess grandmaster to lose to an engine in a tournament, which is a big milestone. And for those that play chess, there are some openings uh, and tactics that are named after Brent Larson. And then 1997, like Justin mentioned at the beginning, uh, Deep Blue defeats Kasparov. Um, they first played in 1996, and Kasparov won that match. And then they came back in 1997 uh, with the new Deep Blue. 
And these statistics are, are kind of averaged out. They're kind of taken from the IBM team and from Kasparov himself. Uh, but they estimate that Deep Blue is calculating 50 billion positions every three minutes. And Kasparov believes that he was calculating 10 positions every three minutes. Um, and then to kind of give you an idea of scale for this, uh, Deep Blue had over 200 processors in it. So it was a very specialized hardware um, to process all those positions. And the crazy thing is today, we can take chess engines today um, and we can run them just on any laptop. You know, we can just go down to the store, $300, buy a laptop, uh, and we can run an engine that can beat the best human player today on just this cheap little hardware we can grab at the store. Um, and those chess engines today, Dockfish is currently number one. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. When you, uh, like if you go to chess.com uh, or if you play on Lee Chess, which is uh, uh, my personal favorite because it's all open source and I'm a developer. That's what I like. Um, when you run the analysis on the games or you're playing against one of those bots, it's probably one powered by Stockfish behind the scenes. Uh, there is Leela Chess Zero. This is open source. This is a true deep learning machine learning engine. Um, unlike Stockfish, which we're going to talk about the difference in a minute here. Um, Leela Chess Zero is based on the Alpha Zero implementation. Um, and Alpha Zero is closed source. It's owned by DeepMind. They haven't really released a ton of uh, really deep details in, into how the implementation works. Um, it's more the theory and, and how they've applied that theory. Um, so Leela Chess Zero is the community's attempt at that. Uh, it's really fascinating to look at. And there is Alpha Zero. Uh, DeepMind is still doing work with that. There's also Komodo Dragon 3 and Fat Fritz 2, which are put out by, um, they're actually both put out by a company called Chessbase. Um, however, the slide is out of date because as of just a couple days ago, um, Chessbase admitted in, I think it was German court, that they were using uh, the open source Stockfish engine underneath all of it. Uh, but they didn't include the GPL license. They didn't include proper downloads. They kind of violated all those licensing terms. So uh, the Stockfish team and Chessbase have come to an agreement on that and things will change for Komodo and Fat Fritz in the future. Um, there are a lot more though. Uh, there's a lot of you know, individuals that are putting together their own engines. Uh, there's a lot of forks and branches of all of these. Uh, and tcec-chess.com is a fun place to go look. Um, it stands for the Top Chess Engine Championship, and they're just constantly running these engines in these virtual games, and you can watch the engines play each other. Um, and then they have some scheduled tournaments over time, uh, and it's, it's really interesting to just kind of watch bots play bots if you're a chess player. So before we get into like the insides of each engine, um, I think it's important to understand the rules of chess. Um, because if you can't explain the rules, then how can you create a system that follows those rules? So um, no, I'm not gonna explain every single chess rule. Um, we're not gonna go through how exactly you play chess, but I bring this up because um, I wanna clarify one thing about Alpha Zero and Alpha Go. So one of the big marketing points that they that they had was that it taught itself chess. And while that's true, it started with the baseline set of rules, right? Pawns can move this way. They can move two squares to start, but once they move, it's one square forward. They capture diagonally. The queen can move this way. The king can move this way. This is how you're allowed to castle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it knew what legal moves were. What it didn't know was how to apply those. It didn't know any strategy. It didn't know um, any openings. It didn't know what an end game was. Uh, it didn't have any context for that sort of a thing. And so when we talk about Alpha Zero and these chess engines teaching themselves chess or teaching themselves how to play a game, they're still teaching themselves how to do that within the confines of some sort of system. But I do want to share this one little bit because this is I, I learned this actually not too long ago. Um, and everybody talks about how the knight move is the most confusing move in chess. Everybody describes it as like an L or something. Uh, the actual reason that the knight moves that way is 
on any given square, the knight moves to the square that no other piece can move to. Uh, so if, if the queen were on this middle square here, oops, wrong window. If the queen were on this middle square here, you know, the queen could go up and down any direction, left and right any direction, on the diagonal any direction, can't get to these squares. Well, that's where the knight can go. I don't know. I think that's interesting, but I'm also a nerd. All right. So let's actually get into how chess engines work. And yes, I know that's, this is the name of the talk. And now we're 10 minutes into this and we're finally talking about it. Okay, here we go. So how does a chess engine work? At its core, a chess engine is a function that takes some sort of board state and then returns the best possible move. Or ideally, you want it to give you a best possible move. Maybe it just gives you a move. Um, what's inside that function, obviously, is, is what we're talking about. And there's a couple different ways to approach that problem. Every single um, uh, classical chess engine, algorithmic chess engine, as opposed to like a deep learning one, has always tried to approach it in a way similar to how chess players think. So if I sit down at a chessboard in my really amateur way, um, or one of those grandmasters does, we're all approaching it in a very similar fashion. Um, we look at the board and we come up with a list of candidate moves. We say, okay, you know, there's X to the whatever power. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, possible moves on the board. I need to narrow that down to just a couple that I can analyze. Well, how am I going to do that? For a human, that's instinct. Um, that's training. Uh, a lot of chess players have a repertoire specifically for the opening. So for the opening, maybe as white, they always play one e4. Um, so they move the king's pawn forward two squares, and that's always their opening. Uh, and then they kind of branch off from there, depending on how the play goes. Uh, and that's kind of memorization. Uh, once you have those candidate moves, then you think, okay, what's my opponent's next likely response? And uh, that's based on your instinct. That's based on your understanding of that other player. How does that other player play? Um, a lot of chess players do, especially when you're talking like the world championships. So when Magnus was playing um, Jan Nepomnici in the world championships, the last time Magnus will ever be the world champion. For those who don't follow chess, Magnus said he's not going to defend his, his world title anymore. Um, so the next world title is going to be uh, two different players. Um, but uh, they do very deep preparation, right? They go back and they look at the history of how does this other chess player think? And they try to get in their head. And then based on that, they say, okay, well, I think these are their three or four likely candidate moves when I make my move. How am I going to respond to that? And they go through that over and over again. Average player, me, I can do one, maybe two moves ahead if I'm really lucky and I'm like, and I'm really focused in on point that day the best chess players can do 10 or 15 moves ahead at a minimum. And all that that I just said is a decision tree, right? If, if you're sitting in your top side class and you had to create a program, this is what you're gonna create. You're gonna create a decision tree, right? So uh, we're gonna take all of the, the possible decisions and the possible consequences and we're gonna map it out and then we can just kind of iterate over that and figure out what our best possible path is. It's easy, right? Let's calculate all of the moves and let's store the moves. No, um, chess is, is mind-bogglingly big and for as, as mind-bogglingly big as, as chess is, Go is even bigger, um, uh, which is why there was so much focus on, on AlphaGo. Sorry, I'm kind of changing topics there. We talked about Go at the very beginning of this. Um, so how big are we talking here exactly? So tic-tac-toe. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of uh, kids in their comp sci class, one of the first things they do is write a program to, to play tic-tac-toe. Um, and that has a problem space, a game tree size of 10 to the fifth. Connect four, more complicated. I believe there's 64 squares in Connect four. Um, it's 10 to the 21st. Atoms in the human body, 10 to the 27th. Not at chess yet. Atoms in the entirety of the physical earth, 
10 to the 49th. We're not to the number of possibilities in chess yet. Adams in the Milky Way, 10 to the 68th. Not to the possible number of moves in chess yet. Adams in the Visible Universe, literally, this is true. 10 to the 78th. The number of possibilities in chess is 10 to the 123rd. I believe, I don't have the number in front of me, but I believe the possibilities for Go is 10 to the 360th. I believe. Is, is this like number of ways a full game is played or like different boards or what is the? Yes. So, um, so given all of the starting moves and then all the variations off of those moves and then all the variations off of those moves, these are the possible variations all the way down the board for legal play. Okay, thanks. Um, and that that obviously doesn't include or like that doesn't trim anything for good moves, right? There's ways to checkmate an opponent in like three or four moves. For those who have seen Glass Onion, um, the very first scene where they're trying to solve the puzzle, um, that like that's an actual famous checkmate that they do, but nobody would would fall for that if they know how to play chess. All right, so we can't calculate every possible move. Um, absolutely impossible. I, I and I, I, again, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me. Uh, just kind of pulling this from memory, uh, from uh, from Deep Mind. I believe Deep Mind said that uh, back in 2016, when they were able to beat the the world's best Go player, if they had tried to calculate that entire game tree for Go. Uh, and they put every computer on the planet working on that problem, uh, it would have taken them something like 100 million years to calculate uh, you know, the entirety of, of that game tree. So it's, it's, not, just, it's not just big, it's, it's unreasonably big. It's, you, you know, it's, it's too big to deal with. So that brings us to Minimax. Um, Minimax, I think a lot of people did it uh, in, in their, you know, CS 101 class. I know I did. Um, and basically, uh, it's for solving a decision tree, one person is trying to minimize the value, one person is trying to maximize the value. This is the easiest way to solve tic-tac-toe. I have a diagram coming up that we're going to talk about in a minute um, that, that really illustrates this. Uh, but first, we can kind of simplify that a little bit for chess. Uh, it, is a, it is a two player game and it is a zero sum game. One person loses, one person wins, or you know, no one loses, no one wins, there's a draw in the middle. So uh, if we can calculate a score for one side, you can just multiply it by negative one to get whatever that score is for the other side as we're trying to evaluate these individual moves. Um, using relatively arbitrary numbers, because we're not going to get into how, how chess is, is evaluated here. Um, but, you know, if it evaluates that, that white has a score of positive five, that immediately means that black has a score of negative five. Because, again, it's a zero-sum game. Only one can win, one can lose. And this is what it looks like. And apparently it's already in the middle of the animation. So great. So you have the current game state uh, and it's gonna go down a branch and it's gonna go all the way down that branch and say, okay, this gets me a value of five here. Um, so this node becomes five and this player is trying to minimize that. Um, and so this evaluates to six, nope, I want the five branch. Okay, this is four, seven, four, no, nope, we're not gonna, oh, this gets me three. I like this branch, oh, this, Right, and we're gonna keep going through that whole, that whole game tree over and over and over again. Um, and again, for, for one player's move, it's trying to maximize that value. For the other player, it's trying to minimize that value. And then your algorithm is trying to find that best path through the tree for you to maximize your value uh, or to minimize it, depending on which side you're on. Kind of went over that a little bit quick. Um, but I think Minimax is, is very easily searchable here. What makes it more complicated um, is that, again, that, that decision tree is so massive. We can't run that algorithm over the entire decision tree. Like not only, like even if we had even calculated, 
if, if we somehow we could do that, it would take forever to process that. Um, so that's where alpha beta pruning comes in. So the idea of alpha beta pruning is that we can just start to ignore entire branches off of that tree because it's worse than a move we've already found. So I don't care what happens. I don't need to continue down that game tree to figure out who wins or loses. It's a worse move based on the evaluation that I'm giving it. So I'm just gonna stop processing and move on to the next branch. Um, and that's what this, this graphic is trying to illustrate here. So that similar sort of a decision tree, but over here, this is giving us a score of eight in, in this evaluation function. We don't need to actually process any of these. We don't need to consider any of these results because it's giving us a worse result than what we've already calculated here. So we can start to ignore entire um, branches of the tree. And this is, uh, um, this is uh, trimming the, the, the depth of the search. Right, so we don't have to calculate all the way through to the end game every single time. We can just start to say, nope, nope, nope. Let's move our processing power back to figuring out a better move. And that's how Stockfish works. It's all mostly hand coded at this point. That's actually that's a lie. We'll talk about more. Talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, there's other optimizations that happen inside of the chess engines. Um, move order matters. Uh, you know, so maybe you've got this. A uh, particular sequence where you can get to a checkmate, but you can only get to the checkmate if you move the knight first and then this piece and then this piece. And if you did it in a different order, you would lose. Um, so there are some optimizations to try to check for that move order. Um, there are opening books. I mentioned the, the repertoire uh, that a lot of players have. There is, um, they call it chess theory, but it's basically just like a known list of moves uh, up to a certain point. Um, and a, a, the best players have them memorized. There's also end game tables. Uh, you can go search table base right now. They have chess solved for, I believe up to seven pieces with perfect play in the end game. So if you have um, seven pieces or less on the board uh, and everybody plays perfect, we know whether that's a win, a loss or a draw um, for you at any given time. So those end game tables can just be baked right into the engine. We can know that right off the bat and that saves a whole lot of calculation. We don't have to figure that out. We've already calculated it. Um, now, hopefully what everybody's thinking is, well, it's not machine learning. And yep, you're right. And this is applied AI. We should probably talk about machine learning. Um, so that's what alphas, or I'm sorry, that's what Stockfish did. Stockfish is, is um, alpha beta pruning over a Negamax algorithm, and then they've just highly, highly optimized that for chess. Um, machine learning is this idea of taking these statistics um, and finding those patterns and being able to make, uh, uh, or having the system make these decisions off of these patterns that we found in the data. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of the various ways that we can do machine learning. We are going to talk about neural networks here. Um, neural networks are optimized uh, for solving these kind of problems that we're talking about. Um, they're also very popular today when everybody talks about deep learning and they're talking about neural networks, right? Um, this is what it looks like for those that, that haven't seen this. Um, there's this idea of these multiple layers. Um, we have the inputs, they bounce around through all of these different nodes, and there's n number of nodes in the middle there, uh, depending on how you set up your particular network. Uh, and then we get some sort of output at the end. Um, that's just math, right? That's just feeding data into a function. The function gives you an output that's not really learning, right? We have to have some way to, uh, from those outputs, be able to come back and teach that algorithm something so that it improves over time. So how does a neural network actually learn? This is the fancy way of representing that. 
we have an initial weight, we have a gradient, we have the cost minimum, and we're trying to bring that value down as close to basically zero as possible. Um, another way to put that is that, you know, for any given value, it's got some sort of error percentage associated with it. And we're trying to get that error as close to zero as possible. Um, in layman's terms though, I think this is the best way to represent it uh, because this is, this is literally what the computer is doing. Uh, when I wrote this slide, my son was in kindergarten and uh, this is, this almost happened. This is almost a true story. I uh, asked what one plus one was. Um, and well, you know, maybe one of the kids, you know, your, your neural network raises its hand and says, it's 11. Well, it makes a lot of sense. It's one and one and you put them together, you can cat them together. It's 11. Yes, I got it right. No, you didn't. That's like way wrong. But we have a teacher, we have something that can look at it and say, no, that's wrong. And you go, okay, well, if that was wrong, let's try five. Well, it's wrong, but it's not as wrong. You're going in the right direction. Okay, great. What about three? Nope, but you're very, very close. It's two. Ta-da! And so that is how the algorithm loops back on itself. Um, and in data science terms, that's supervised learning. Because in this situation, we had the teacher that was there to say, well, no, it's not 11, but well, five is closer. Um, and that's called a feed forward where you, you execute the function, you've got loss, that's how wrong you are. Are you going in the right direction or not? Um, and then you back propagate it. So you take that particular result, you move it back into your model, you adjust some of the values, the weights and the biases. Uh, and every time you do that, and you get a different result that's known as an epoch. Again, though, this isn't really what Leela Chess Zero and Alpha Zero and, and those engines are doing. They're not doing supervised learning. They're doing unsupervised learning. Um, I have tried so many different ways to explain what unsupervised learning is, and I'm going to give it a shot, and I would love your raw feedback on, on how my explanation is here. So here's, here's the, the, the textbook definition. It's analyzing uncategorized, unlabeled data and finding hidden structures in it, which makes sense, I think, as a sentence and an idea, but how does a computer do that, right? How do you represent that in code and in math? Um, and there's two different ways to do that. Clustering, you can group items by similarities or association, which is how things relate to each other. And the best way that I've, I've found to think about this concept um, is uh, imagine you go to a foreign country for the first time, you're not familiar with any of their cuisine, and you just have this giant table of food in front of you, and none of it looks familiar, you don't know what any of it is. But it's all edible, you know, none of it's going to poison you. So you start to taste a few things and you taste a few more and you taste a few more and you can begin to find, okay, well, these ones are kind of sweet. Maybe these ones are sour, these are bitter. Um, or maybe you could categorize them by like, well, for this one, I needed a knife and a fork. For this one, I need a spoon. Uh, you know, this one I drink out of a cup. And then after you've kind of grouped them in that way, you can go back through again and maybe uh, maybe as you're going through the sweet ones, maybe you start to find a hint of, I don't know, a spice like a cinnamon or something, and you can start to pull those out and you can refine those groups over and over and over again. And you, you don't know what the ingredients are, right? You, you, you don't really know anything about those particular foods. You don't know what they're called. You don't know how they were prepared, but just based on touching them and smelling them and tasting them, you can start to categorize them. Uh, and that's what the computer is doing under the hood. Uh, you do have to give it a little bit of context. You, you do kind of have to tell it how to categorize things. If you're doing image recognition, well, it needs to be able to recognize colors and pixels and things like that. But that's the, that's the basics of what it's doing under the hood. So now we want to take this idea of unsupervised learning um, and, and this neural network, and we want to put it all together and, and pull it together into an engine the way that Leela Chess Zero and, and Alpha Zero does. 
So let's start to put those pieces together. So we've got we've got our, our current position, whatever the board is. We've got this, this machine learning model in, in the middle here. Uh, we want it to output our next move. Uh, and then if the game's not over, we want to repeat over and over and over again until the game is over. And then someone won, uh, which would be a one or a draw, which is zero or a loss, which is negative one. But there's a problem with this particular diagram, which is that we're only getting one move. We're not analyzing, oops, change the slide, Nathan. Um, we're only getting one move. It's based on a single position. We're not doing any deep analysis on this yet, yet. And so that's where we need to, we need to take the next step. We need to start to have this system learn and improve itself and go through more of those possibilities. So let's improve our neural network. For this, we're gonna use a convolutional neural network. Um, there are a couple different variations of them, but again, the, the CNNs are very popular, um, especially with uh, like Dolly and, and all of the image stuff. They're all running or, or some form of a convolutional neural network under the hood. And then we've got our input, the board position. I think that makes sense. And for our output, we're actually gonna get multiple values output. Um, the terms for these are the policy head and the value head. Um, what those translate to in chess is one is, is the move probability uh, and one is the winning probability. So for this given move, there's a 10% chance that I'm gonna win. Or for this particular move, there's a 70% chance that I'm gonna win. Well, that's probably the one that we're gonna wanna pick. And if we throw that into our diagram, we know of this. So we have our current position. Uh, we're gonna feed it into this neural network, which is gonna give us multiple choices for the moves that we can make. And then out of those moves, we need to pick what the best move is, play it, and then rinse and repeat again. Um, picking a move is back to something of a decision tree issue. And in the unsupervised learning in the board game space, I'm, I'm actually, I don't think this is even applied outside of uh, using computers to play games, honestly. Um, Monte Carlo tree search uh, is, is the preferred method of handling this. Um, for anybody that plays um, Total War, the Total War video game series, uh, the way the AI works in that game, they use a Monte Carlo tree search. That's what powers the, the Total War AI. So this is what that looks like. Where the alpha beta pruning uh, was pruning for depth, the Monte Carlo tree search is pruning for breadth. So what it's going to do um, is it's going to simulate entire games all the way to the end of the game, and it's going to give it a win or a loss. Uh, and we're trying to find that optimized path through this particular set of moves. Um, this diagram is a little quirky because it's already filled in a bunch, um, you know, but this for this particular player, we've won three games out of three. Uh, I believe this is actually, this was taken off Wikipedia. I believe this is a typo. This should be two out of six because of the two here. Um, no, I'm sorry, one out of six because it's the inverse because it's the other player. This is right. And then seven out of 10 or, and then so on. And so we pick this branch because this looks like a winning branch for us. Uh, and so we're gonna continue to simulate those games all the way down. We're gonna expand this all the way down to the final result of that game. Again, we're not trimming for the depth here. We're gonna play out that entire game uh, and we're gonna simulate that X number of times, depending on how you wanna set up uh, your particular engine. Um, and then we're gonna feed those values back up through the tree. You know, So we won three out of three here. Now we won four out of four here because this was a loss for the next player. Or for, I'm sorry, for the other player and so on. Um, and yeah, and again, playing it all the way down the tree, the, the whole thing, uh, which can be a little bit expensive. Um, so you, this takes some fine tuning um, to throw a couple actual numbers on this. Uh, the way that the DeepMind team did it with Alpha Zero, uh, they ran 800 simulations every time they went through this as they were improving their model. Um, which actually to me sounds like not that many. I, I would have expected more, 
at the time, but they settled on 800 and it seemed to do pretty well. Um, there's two, and there's, sorry, there's two different ways that you can handle this, this Monte Carlo tree search. You can do exploration or exploitation. Uh, so exploration, you're doing fewer simulations. Uh, you're playing riskier moves, um, but that can be more exciting. Uh, that can throw your opponent off more because it's it's less expected. Uh, it can also be a little bit quicker because you're you're playing a little bit riskier. Um, or you can exploit, uh, which is better winning chances. You're doing deeper searches. Um, a human way to explain this, um, this is a common example. I believe this is even on the Wikipedia page for, for the Monte Carlo tree search, um, is how would you pick a destination for a vacation? Are you going to go somewhere that you've never been before and see how it goes? Maybe maybe it ends up being a terrible vacation and, and it wasn't that great of an idea in the end. Uh, or are you going to go somewhere uh, that you've been before that's more comfortable you know that you're going to have a good time if, if you go to this particular destination. Uh, and those are the two different ways that you can choose to filter through these, these problems. Um, so like I said, we've, we've got the Monte Carlo tree search versus Minimax. So Monte Carlo tree search is used in the unsupervised learning. Minimax, Negamax, that's learned in kind of the classical algorithm. Um, there are advantages to the Monte Carlo tree search. There is no evaluation function. You don't have to uh, try to look at a given board state and determine if that's better for you or better for your opponent um, because it's playing the whole game. It, it knows whether you won or lost. It goes all the way to the end. Uh, and it grows asymmetrically. It's got less branches. Um, we're Again, we're, we're trimming for breadth with the Monte Carlo tree search, um, not trimming for depth. There are some disadvantages to that too. Um, there are trap moves. Uh, there are off the radar moves that get pruned. You might accidentally prune a great move way over here because kind of the moves leading up to it looked a little suspicious. Um, so there are some trade offs and that's where running those number of simulations are going to help you out over time. So going back to this picture. We now can kind of answer how we're going to pick a move. So when we get a set of moves uh, coming out of our neural network. Uh, then we can pick the move using Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. We're still not quite teaching our system to improve though, because given a position, we're always going to end up with the same move, no matter what. And it's never going to change. Uh, it's never going to learn. It's never going to improve. And that's the whole idea of reinforcement learning. We want our system to get better over time. We've kind of taught it how to make a very good choice, but we haven't taught it how to make, or how we haven't taught it how to uh, get a better list of choices in the first place. And this is what that little diagram looks like. We're gonna run through the whole system and we're gonna have a state at the end of it. And we're gonna have a reward, which is basically win or loss in chess. Uh, and then we're going to feed it back through over and over and over again. And putting it all together, this is what it looks like. Um, so we've got, sorry, I got to move a window here. It's blocking half of my screen. There we go. Um, so we've got the curve position. We're going to feed it into our neural network. It's going to generate a set of moves. We're going to run the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm over that to determine. Um, what is the, the best possible move that we can play at this point? We're going to play that move. We're going to repeat that cycle until the whole game is over. And did we lose? Did we draw? Or did we win? And we're going to take that, feed it back through the loss function. Again, I'm not providing actual code here. Um, but this loss function goes back into that neural network and back propagates all of those values, adjusts those weights, adjusts those biases, tweaks all of those values throughout the system so that the next time the same position comes in, maybe we get a different set of moves, maybe we don't, and we can continue to improve and iterate on that over time so that when you, get, when you give your system that particular position, um, it's providing better, smarter, more accurate, more winning moves right out of the box every single time. Um, and you just run through that over and over and over again. Uh, 
uh, where'd my number go? Oh, I thought I had the number written down. I believe that Alpha Zero went through, it was millions and millions and millions of iterations on this um, because it had to teach itself how to play. It had to learn all of that strategy at the beginning. Um, uh, and then, you know, and then we wound up with, with a winning chess engine. So if we put all that together, I just said that we wound up with a winning chess engine, but if we put it all together, the best chess engine is still Stockfish. Leela Chess Zero and Alpha Zero have beat it a couple times, uh, but overall, uh, Stockfish still wins. This classical algorithm um, put up against you know the best of deep learning still wins almost every single time. So kind of the question that we get to is why, um, and at least in the chess world. Uh, Stockfish just has a more structured way of looking at that particular problem. And it also benefits from those opening books and those end game tables where everything's pre-calculated. Whereas in the deep learning model, it's trying to figure that out for itself over time and doesn't have the benefit of all of the other, you know, massive amounts of, of human labor that have gone into this game. Um, but I mean, to plug what Justin mentioned for, for the next one, uh, the next applied AI meetup about healthcare, that may not, you know, be true in scenarios outside of chess. So you really have to kind of understand your particular problem space to figure out what's going to work best. Um, but there's, there's more because Stockfish introduced NNUE, um, which is backwards and it's, uh, uh something updatable neural network i just forgot what the e stands for of course when we're recording this i forget what the e stands for um updatable neural networks and so what stockfish is doing in we're up to version 15 of stockfish right now um, and they introduced this in version 12 and what it's doing is it's a valuation function for its minimax and, and alpha beta pruning is now based on machine learning so they've created this uh, neural network model uh, with reinforcement learning, similar to efficiently updatable neural networks. Thank you, Lars. Um, uh, so they've created this, this algorithm, right? This, this deep learning function uh, through this reinforcement learning through a very similar process uh, to what Leela Chess Zero and, and Alpha Zero do. Um, and they're using that as the evaluation function for their particular move. So instead of trying to determine, you know, from the board state, whether white is winning or black is winning, they can plug it back into this, uh, this neural network that has already played these games all the way through to the end. And it can tell them, well, thumbs up or thumbs down, this is a good position or a bad position for you. Uh, and Stockfish has found that that just kind of moved every, it changed everything for them. This was a big game changer for Stockfish. Um, they can go a little bit deeper now, they can run more efficiently uh, and their evaluations are much more accurate because again, it's playing that game to the end now. Um, but the trick here is again for chess, it is still supervised learning. Um, what I think is interesting about the way that Stockfish is using this though, is that the supervision is now starting to get handed over to an unsupervised or, or a, a model that was created with unsupervised learning. Um, and I think that that dynamic is very interesting uh, for the way that things are moving forward. Uh, so we're kind of at the end here. Um, a couple quick takeaways. Uh, for me, the work that I've done um, with, uh, with machine learning, uh, specifically with chess engines, rules matter, right? Um, you have to understand what your boundaries are. Um, I, I, I think about like self-driving cars all the time when, when I'm thinking about this and, and rules matter, right? Stop signs mean stop. Red lights mean stop. You can't just create a system that tries to learn that on its own because you don't quite know what that end result is going to be. There are certain things, there are certain boundaries for your systems 
um, that at least in my experience I've found is, has been very helpful uh, to make sure that those are coded into the system and part of it uh, as opposed to something that it is learning and assuming over time. Um, but Stockfish is still the best, right? AIML, maybe it's, maybe it's not a magic bullet for you. Maybe it's a combination, maybe it's a tool in the tool chest as opposed to the final solution. Um, you know, it's exciting stuff, but I think you got to, again, pay attention to those rules, pay attention to your problem space and see where it fits best. Uh, and there's a little bit of experimentation there. Classical algorithms are still used all day, every day because they work. We've, we've optimized them. Um, we know how to apply them. And so trying to find that balance between the machine learning and hard coding those algorithms, I, I think, is the real question for development teams trying to implement this stuff. Uh, and when you bring the, the two together, at least in the chess world, you've got a monster. Uh, and, and maybe that works in your job too. And that's my talk. That's all, folks. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Yeah. So if there were any questions, I mean, feel free to jump in. I, I have a question. So the top human players will pick different openings to kind of just so people don't prepare, like how do chess bots do that? Or do they just fall into a conventional, always the same opening? Or yeah, that was, so when AlphaZero came out, uh, which AlphaZero was, was the first true, like deep learning unsupervised engine that was out there. Um, and, and that's why it made a big splash. And uh, it was very unconventional in its openings again, because it had taught itself, right? It didn't know strategy. It didn't know the history of all of these openings. It didn't know all this chess theory that the players knew. Um, and uh, like Justin was talking about at the beginning with like Gary Kasparov's book about learning from these chess engines, uh, a lot of the players have started to take that learning into their games. Um, there's, there's a finite set of openings that, that makes sense logically in the game of chess. Um, there's a very famous uh, opening right now called the Bong Cloud, uh, which is um, not to get too deep into chess, but you, 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 you move your king's pawn forward uh, and then you move your king forward one square. And by moving your king forward one square, it's now very exposed, it's very dangerous. Checkmate of the king is, is obviously the goal of the game. Uh, so you've exposed your king, which is dangerous, but also by moving your king, you've lost castling rights, which is where you can flip the king and the rook, um, which is a very important move in most chess games because it moves your king over into this into into a safe, protected corner by the rook. Um, but a lot of people are playing that and finding some success with it. And one of that, like an origin of that is is within these engines. Um, so. You know, humans will pick these kind of predictive ones. Uh, the engines at this point, now that they've analyzed enough games, they're starting to pick the very popular um, openings that, that human players have been playing for decades. Uh, but there is give and take between the two uh, where, you know, we're, we're far enough into this journey with computer engines and chess that we can see how engines have affected that opening play and how those that chess theory has evolved over time. But then as that evolves over time, we can see how that gets reflected back in the play of, of the bots and the engines, um, which, is, which is interesting. There's actually, a, I'll try to look it up here real quick. There's an entire book about just that. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, this is more, go ahead, please. Um, so sometimes I've seen like a, a chess brain teaser where they show you a picture of the board and ask you what to do next. And, you know, the, the unintuitive move is to sacrifice your queen and then you can checkmate them in a couple moves. Is there, mm -hmm. how, um, how, how does that like affect the decision tree and the, and how far down you need to process it? Cause I would think that that would be right, rated as a terrible move. And that's my first instinct to think I wouldn't even think of sacrificing my queen. <laughs> Yep. So that is where it takes a little bit of tuning on, um, you know, if, if you're doing like the, the Stockfish uh, Minimax Negmax style on your alpha beta pruning um, or the Monte Carlo tree search on the machine learning side, um, it takes a little bit of tuning on that. You want to make sure that you 
um, what's what's the best way to put it? You want to make sure that you're not immediately uh, uh, eliminating one of those moves. You want to at least look just a little bit past it to see if there's a possibility there. Um, there's a very famous concept in chess called uh, the Greek gift sacrifice, um, which is a bishop. Um, I should probably try to bring up a board here real quick. Um, let's see if I can do it. This is Lee Chess. This is where I play most of my stuff. Uh, isn't there just like an analysis board somewhere in here? Maybe not. I don't want to play an actual, there it is. Um, so if you've, it's going to make me play all of the moves. This is not a real thing. So if you've got, so this is castling. So if you've got your king in the corner, um, and now I can't even play the move that I was going to play, you can, uh, you can sacrifice like a bishop in the corner, which is a check, and the king has to then capture it. Um, you know, but then maybe your queen comes out or, uh, you know, maybe you've got a knight that jumps in with a, with check or something, and you can continue that sequence down to a checkmate. Um, but you are sacrificing the bishop for that particular, uh, for that particular win. Um, there are common patterns like that. And in the Stockfish engine, that's something that they have hand coded. Uh, in the unsupervised learning, that's something where they had to kind of tweak how they were handling that Monte Carlo tree search to make sure that they weren't um, just by default eliminating those branches out of the tree. Uh, but that is one of the risks too, where, you know, depending on how you have those thresholds set, how you've set it up, how many games you're running through, um, how many games like your initial data sets coming from, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it might be something that gets missed. You, the engines might miss the best possible move um, because it looks like a terrible move on its surface. Uh, and it's not until three or four moves later that you actually see the payoff. So just to be clear, for, for training these chess engines, are they playing themselves? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I, I mean, it, I think it depends on the chess engine. Um, Leela Chess Zero uh, started by playing itself. Um, now it is improving. Uh, like there's a bot on chess.com. Uh, there's, there's a Leela bot. Um, there's a bot on, on Lee Chess. It plays all the time in the, the top chess engine, the TCEC games. So it is playing against other engines now. Uh, but that initial build out of the engine, it just played itself over and over and over again um, in, in that loop. Okay, thanks. Hey, Nathan, that was really interesting. Um, Thank you. I was wondering how the playing styles kind of change between the bots, like, and is that correlated to the way it's programmed and the, the approaches you can take to program it? Uh, what do you mean? So you're like, talking about that deep learning versus kind of that rules that rules-based mm -hmm. kind of approach to stockfish. I like, how do you think that affects the style of play for each, for each bot? Um, so there's, yeah. When you play one of the bots on any of those, the Lee Chess, chess.com, chess24, whatever you're playing on, um, the bots have different ratings. I don't, I haven't seen much with the bots having a style as much as they have a strength. Um, and that strength is just kind of based on the data it was fed into and how many iterations it went through. Um, in chess, we score uh, based on an ELO score, ELO, uh, which is an, a scoring algorithm used um, in multiple things, not just chess. And so, you know, the best players are 2,700, 2,800. I am 1,200. Um, and we can apply a score to a given iteration of an engine based on that. And, and so the bots have different strengths. 
Um, I'm not aware of a bot that has a particular style of play. I think that's an interesting proposition. Like if you had a bot that always played uh, like a specifically unconventional opening or something. So Nathan, um, just yeah, uh, so chess.com has different bots and some of them have like more aggressive, more defensive, like bring out the queen early, different styles. Um, and I think that's largely based on strength though. Um, Okay. If you, if you, uh, especially if you sit down and watch some of the chess streamers that do speed runs, you will see patterns in the play of the different strengths of the players. Um, and as you get higher up, um, unless there's an obvious, uh, you know, advantage that can be exploited um, or a mistake that can be exploited by the player, they're making much more subtle um slow appearing moves they're not being super aggressive with the queen they're not you know attacking right away they're doing a lot of development and and um you know like building up a fortress on their end of the board first um and it's it's a much slower way of playing but that's associated with the strength of the player because that's how you have to play at that high of a level when you're playing an opponent that's at high level with you um and i think that that might get viewed again i could be wrong here i'll do a little bit of research on it but um i think that gets confused for style sometimes because when you're a weaker player if you're playing a stronger bot that bot's going to see the mistake that you made and it is going to attack it ruthlessly because that's how it's going to win um if you were playing better moves and and grandmaster style moves it would not be as aggressive at that time um, because you would be defending better did that make sense? Yeah, sorry, I think I jumped in on Sean's question, but yeah. Well, and, and to Sean too, did that kind of answer your question or no? Yeah, it did, thank you. Okay. Um, now, that said, there are, uh, we talked about mittens at the very beginning. Uh, I think before the recording started, there is a, there's a new mittens bot that's out on chess.com. Um, there are uh there are some uh i guess meme bots that are out there um but they i wouldn't consider those necessarily like a chess engine they're they're they very much take the chess engine and then kind of tweak it and say nope you're gonna do this goofy thing every time and and then let the engine take over um also worth noting too that there is uh there's uh there's several different variations of chess at this point um, there's Fisher Random, uh, where the, the back rank is shuffled. Um, so it's not always rooks, you know, knights, bishops, etc. Um, it gets shuffled. Uh, that Bobby Fisher came up with that game. There's, uh, I think it's also maybe called Chess 960. I think so. Um, there's like three, four player chess now. There's Duck Chess, which is very popular on chess.com where you make a move and then there's a duck like just a like a, a yellow rubber duck and it's a blocking piece and so you make a move and then you can place the duck somewhere um and you know you can block another piece you can't capture it um and then the other player you know makes their move and then moves the duck uh lots of different variations of chess and that affects the play of all of these engines as well. Um, a lot of the engines are capable of playing these other chess variations. And, uh, and then th those chess, the moves from those chess variations are then fed back into the engine and it affects the play of other variations as well because it's constantly iterating over itself. And so that's where you might see some of those very unconventional, very strange uh, moves as well, because you know it works fine in this position. This position's maybe only mostly reached when you play Fisher Random, but we're going to take the risk and and do it in standard classical chess. I have an, another question. Sorry to keep if yeah. other people want to jump in. Um, if you want to make a chess engine that works as a good opponent for non-grandmaster humans or even like you know how do you tune it down and that's also a difficult problem um because i think right now some of the bots just every now and then make a stupid move yes. it's not very human you know yes know it, you... it's uh if you start to watch chess analysis they will they will refer to it as like a human move 
and an engine move. And they are very distinctly different. Um, and because it, it's just like, it's, it's a move that you look at it and it's just so counterintuitive uh, to, to everything um, that you've been taught in how to play chess and how to approach chess and how to think about it. And then this move comes out of nowhere. Uh, and that's a very engine-like move because, you know, the engines don't nest, they, they don't, they have their own biases, but they don't have the same kind of biases and quirks that, that our human brains do. Um, the, uh, the, if you want to write your own, um, it's really hard to get one that is a fair opponent if you're not a decent chess player. Because even just running like the most basic minimax algorithm with the most basic alpha beta pruning is probably going to kick your butt. Um, it's just the computers think so fast. We can go so deep and so big on those particular decision trees now. It's, it's just super efficient. Uh, you know, it, it can just do better than your human brain can at this point. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure how you would make an engine that is a beginner necessarily because even even the beginner bots are extremely hard <laughs> um that's a that's a challenge that we haven't really quite solved yet because i i i would almost argue that now that i'm talking through this like this is a thought that just occurred to me um i would almost argue i think that that's an entirely different problem to solve and needs a completely different approach than what we're talking about here. Because all of these optimizations, everything that we've talked about is specific to winning the game. Um, and that just means being a very strong player. Uh, you know, trying to, to get a weaker player, how do you put a flaw into that? I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this isn't really a question, just more of a more of a comment, I guess. It's uh, you know, I I think it's interesting, and and maybe it's just Moore's law coming into effect. But you know, the engines were so far away in the '60s and '70s and '80s, and then they just really caught up, right? And I think it, I mean, this this so so called, I guess I call it maybe the brute force method. I guess that we, now we've been able to, you know, once the processing power got to a certain point where they could actually go through the tree. Um, that's when I think you saw the significant improvements between essentially, you know, 1990 to 1997, it just completely scaled. Is that, is that sort of a true assessment? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Cause one of the very interesting things about where the chess engines are at is you could, you can grab stock, you can go to stockfish.org right now, download stockfish, run it on your system. And it, it would be the world's best, like if they were sitting in your living room, it would beat them again you can just walk down to, to best buy and spend you know 2.99 grab the cheapest laptop that they have and it will still beat magnus carlson sitting in your living room nine times out of ten eight times out, enough times that it would win the match right and um i don't know that that's necessarily true of uh like leela chess zero and alpha zero yet because it requires all of that additional processing for the machine learning um but as computers continue to get faster, uh, you know, who knows what that limit's going to be? Uh, and uh, I think that's where I think that's where it's some of the fear comes from uh, from like game players, where uh, you know they fear that it's going to become a solved game, and so then people are just going to memorize these specific things, and then it's it's not going to be fun or not be a challenge anymore. Mm -hmm. I I don't buy that i you know if somebody wants to go memorize it i'm just i'm not going to play them i'll go play somebody that actually wants to play the game with me um so I, i'm not super worried about that but it's it's definitely something that's coming i think and as we talk about quantum computing too like just you know who knows what's going to happen with that so, do you think all the improvements hardware there's no like software ideas that Oh no, there's there's definitely software ideas, but a, a lot of the improvements in Stockfish over time came because of hardware, like talking about those end game calculations where we can say for um, 
you know, for, for these given seven pieces with perfect play, we know 100% whether it's a win loss or a draw um, for every combination of those seven pieces. But to be able to calculate that, we had to keep improving the hardware over time. So I think it's, um, I think it's kind of one of those give and takes over time. Uh, we could probably argue about, you know, which one was, you know, the chicken or the egg. Um, but, you know, as the table base expanded, then that got put into the chess engines, the chess engines got better and smarter, created more variations, you know, then we could loop back on those and, and uh, it's a constant feedback loop over time. Um, I think the only reason I brought up the hardware was because I think it's very interesting that um, you can run these uh, amazing programs on average computer hardware at this point even actually honestly just a raspberry pi like a little 40 dollars computer um, is probably enough power to run some of these things at this point and just kind of thinking about how far we've come and then thinking about what those possibilities are just blows my mind all right thanks yeah, I guess I was I was reading just in some of the early days, it was like the 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 algorithms sort of like locked in on some of these certain moves like you're talking about. Oh, the winner always castles. So the moment the mm -hmm. the, the 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 computer could castle, it would castle, but it would castle just in a ridiculous time. And so some of the early algorithms were just flat out dumb. And and once you knew, oh, I just need to make this three moves and the same thing, the computer did the same thing over and over again. And so that's that's what I think is interesting that they've been able to make in such a way so it doesn't just repeat the same moves over and over again. Yeah, exactly. I also heard that some of the um, not that long ago bots like would ignore castling because it was so difficult to implement. And yes, <laughs> I don't know if some of, I didn't quite yeah. understand. That. Well, so some of the very early engines um, were very uh, numeric based and, and positionally based um, as opposed to strategy based. Um, and a lot of those goofy little quirks with chess and rules were ignored because it was quite difficult to implement at the time, castling being one of them. Um, you can long castle, which would be what I, I did in that little quick demo. You know, long castling uh, is on this side of the board. Uh, you, I'm sorry, short castling or king side castling is this side. Uh, you can also do a queen side castle where the king goes here and the rook comes up to the D file. Um, but you can only do that if the king hasn't moved uh, and the rook hasn't moved that you're castling with and the king is not going to pass through check. Um, so for instance, if this bishop were here and this knight wasn't here, um, we couldn't castle queenside because the king would have to travel through check here. And accounting for all of those kind of quirks was just kind of too much for the initial people, um, especially when they were just like, I just want to try to win the chess game. Like, let's just, let's go, let's play moves, let's figure this out. And, um, you know, just kind of that enthusiasm for it. Uh, there's also other quirks called en passant, um, which would be... I don't even know where I'm at in this game. Where how could we do opposite? Um, so we come down here, and then we come here, and then we come here, and then we go here. Uh, so if uh, I can capture this way, and this pawn disappears, it's called opposite or in yeah. passing. Yeah, that's um, like it. yeah. Those those kind of goofy you know quirks for chess are. Um, yeah, I think they were just ignored out of out of convenience by by the original engine people. Just so people know, there's that F E N, and yes. like at the bottom there. So like the the last parts are the things that aren't on the board. Like, can you castle? Is there en passant? All that stuff is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a um, this is a, a ASCII representation of the entire board with a little bit of board state information on here. Um, PGN, uh, portable game notation, uh, is, is another big thing. So, you know, the FEN is a specific position. The PGN is the entirety of the game. Um, and, but again, if you're, if you're building 
a chess engine, you don't want to use the fan, you want to use a bit board. They're just more efficient to update. Okay. Neat. Sorry, did I was I I kind of went a different direction there. No, that's that... good. <laughs> so the bit <laughs> so the bitboard is because you said you might not talk about bitboard, but yeah, I mean we, we can bring it up. Um it's just it got the bitboard's real technical and it's all code and can I even find a good example of it? Yeah. Yeah, see, it's it's technical. <laughs> um, but this is where, because it, it becomes more of this binary representation of the board itself, you can very quickly swap a piece in and out without having to do like a string replacement, um, which you would have to do with the fen, right? You would have to replace this string and move these things around and generate a new fen. Uh, whereas with this, you can just do like an and or an XOR and, and change the board state. Um, nice. That'd be, yeah, that'd be very efficient. Or that is very efficient, basically. It's like assembly. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a good. I don't have a good example of it just like off the top. But yeah, like I said, it's all, <laughs> yeah, bit ops, a little bit more than a conceptual talk, but that's definitely the way to do it. Is there a... Yeah, sort of translating it into ones and zeros. Yeah, just the, the the magnitude of the numbers of ones and zeros and the, the whole length of what, of the sort of the bit mask you have there sort of shows the the 10 to the whatever you said, you know, <laughs> eight, 80 some, you know, permutations, I guess, for the board. Uh, 10 to 123rd for chess. 123rd, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think I think I had heard somewhere that like you can play a game and it's almost like at, at any point in time, the pieces had not actually ever walked through mm -hmm. that same phase in the, in yep. the entire world. <laughs> you've, you've actually yeah. set up the board and gone through a different thing. It just, that's mind boggling that. Yeah, and it's it's the same for a deck of cards too. If you take a deck of fifty-two cards and you shuffle it, the chances of you having the same order that somebody else had after they shuffled the deck of cards is almost zero. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so infinitesimally infinitesimal. In Everybody knows what I was just trying to say there. Small uh, that you know it might as well be zero, and it's the same with chess. Now that really only happens in like the they call it the middle game. Once you're kind of out of that opening prep and out of that opening theory where. I'm playing the London system. And these are the first 10 or 15 moves that are basically always played in the London system. Um, or I'm playing the Karo Khan as black. And these are the first 10 or 15 moves that are typically played as the Karo Khan. You're gonna be in a lot of existing games in that just because those are known strong patterns of attack and defense combined. Um, once you're out of that and you're into the middle game, uh, then especially later middle game the further you get into that the the more you get away from i'd say like 15 or 20 moves in um the chances of you being in a completely unique position that has never been played by anybody else in the world before or at least documented by anybody in the world before um is very very strong crazy which is why i like chess honestly yeah it's different every time well cool if there's no other questions Thank you, Nathan, for your time. This is amazing. Uh, this is, I think, one of one of the best presentations yeah. we've had. So, I mean, just really, really good with regards to getting in only as deep as we needed to go here, but also, <laughs> you know, obviously you're a master of the game. You've been studying this for a long time. So really, really well done. Thank you for breaking it down for layman's and laywomen's terms, I guess, here for, for all of us here. So thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And um, uh justin you know my contact info i think is out there on the on the event page you know if anybody's got interest in playing a game of chess or talking about chess engines or whatever definitely reach out i'm open to it awesome thanks a lot for all my <laughs> answering all my questions yeah absolutely thanks for asking them thanks nathan that was great all right thank have you a good night, everyone have a good night thanks